Uh, Anand did his uh, undergraduate degree at Princeton University. Uh, and after that, he spent uh, a year doing part three in Cambridge uh, at Churchill College, I believe. Uh, after Cambridge, uh, Anand moved to MIT where, where he did his PhD with uh, John Bush and Ruben Rosales. Uh, then he got an NSF postdoctoral fellowship in mathematical sciences, which he spent at Courant Institute in New York. And then I guess he liked New York so much he couldn't get away. And uh, he moved to uh, New Jersey Tech where that, that, that has, well, I used to be there as well at some point, that has one, one of the largest applied mathematics groups uh, in a mathematics department in the US. Uh, they do some, some great work and we'll hear some of that today from Anand. So Anand, all yours. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Demetrius and Peter for the, uh, for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, so today I'll be telling you about um, some ongoing work um, on trying to develop coarse grain models for schooling swimmers. So this is really about, um, let's say like schools of fish or flocks of birds and how they interact with each other um, inside a fluid. So oh, there we go. Um, so hopefully you can see this video. So I'll start by way of motivation with the uh, with the video on the left. So, um, oh yeah, before I start, I should say that um, a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Leif Ristroff and Mike Shelley, who are both the Courant Institute. Um, so I think many of you have probably seen um, either videos or in real life uh, phenomena like those exhibited in the video that's being shown here. Um, this is what I'll call disorder. So this is a uh, flock of starlings. I think it numbers in the thousands. Um, and I think this video actually was taken somewhere in England. Um, and as you can see, they exhibit these beautiful displays um, across a range of space and time scales. And they exhibit something that looks like organized collective behavior. Um, and phenomena like this have been a source of inspiration for uh, physicists, mathematicians, and biologists for a long time now. Basically asking how do and why do animals execute uh, these kinds of um, complex dynamics. Um, so there's been a lot of work in trying to develop mathematical models for a bunch of interacting active agents, which you can think of birds um, or even fish um, as you know, these kinds of agents. Um, but part of the difficulty in developing, um, developing models for systems like these is that there are very few controlled experiments um, and it's hard to do experiments. So one notable Counter example to that statement is, um, a couple of years ago by Portugal and others. Um, so that's the video on the right. So what they did is they took these ibises, so these are these relatively large birds that are being shown here, and they put these little GPS trackers on them. Um, and they essentially allowed them to fly around um, for a while. And they tracked the basically the positions of the birds in three dimensions. And they tried to get access to their wingtip paths as well. So as these birds are flapping, you can, the, the wings essentially trace out curves in space um, and they essentially try to extract the, um, the positional data for all, of these, for all of these different birds. And as you can imagine, the data is rather messy, um, but the sort of the main conclusion of this study was that if you look at the wingtip paths of these birds in a line, so occasionally they, they do execute missions that look like, sort of like the one you can see in the video. Um, the wingtip paths exhibit certain specific spatial phase relationships. So in certain formations, the wingtip paths are in phase, meaning they essentially lie on top of each other. Whereas in other formations like view formations, they tend to be out of phase. Um, so yeah, and you can see here, I think at the bottom of the, at the very bottom of the video, there's an airplane, like a paraplane that's, um, essentially guiding these birds. Um, so there's, uh, the authors of the paper essentially hypothesized that there are some aerodynamic reason for adopting these particular um, phase relationships. Um, so people have sort of conjectured this for a while that maybe the uh, order formations exhibited by uh, birds and fish are due to hydrodynamic interactions. Um, but most models of collective behavior 
um, tend to emphasize the behavior of the constituents rather than the medium through which they move. So in, in the case of birds, it's air, or in the case of fish, it's water. Um, so there've been some um, hydrogen interactions, and I listed some examples um, in the references right below. Um, but what we want to do here, at least for the start of this talk, is I'm going to try to understand the spatial order of formations using a very simple model system. So trying to get away from the biological system, but use a simple physical system to try to inform what might be important in the biological system. So before I go to that, um, I'll just say a quick word about what um, what these uh, uh, self-propelled agent models look like. And there are many of these, so you know, for the interest of time, I, uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, but really the one that um, sort of is at the basis of all of them, or at least a large class of them, is something called the Vichek model. So this was published in 1995, and it's really a very simple model for a bunch of self-propelled interacting agents. So the first equation, so imagine you have a bunch of particles um, R2. And the first equation just says that the uh, position of each object is updated according to its orientation theta. And you're assuming that each particle is self propelled at some speed b that's fixed. All right, so there's a very simple model where the speeds are all fixed. And really, the only non trivial dynamics is occurring in terms of the orientation. So the orientation is what's interesting. That's the equation for theta right below. Um, and basically what this thing says is that the angles, the orientations of each particle um, are determined by averaging the local angles in a region of radius r. So this is supposed to account for some kind of sensing that basically every object or every, uh, every animal, if you'd like, would like to looks in a sensing radius, which is of size r, and averages the angles of its neighbors. And that's what it uses as its new angle. Plus there's a noise term because presumably there's some error in these measurements and, and error to that angle. So basically what you have in the orientational dynamics is you have an adjustment and alignment interaction due to neighbors and then some kind of noise. And the main result here was that as you, so of course, if your noise is too large, you just get disordered behavior, right? Because they're essentially the, um, the objects can't really lock onto any kind of coherent state. But as you decrease the noise, what they observe is a bifurcation to unidirectional motion. So at some non-zero value of the noise. So despite there being some amount of noise, this system can execute essentially something like a flocking transition where all the objects move together um, with roughly the same direction. So that's shown in, that, um, in this image that I took from the paper right um, at the bottom right. Um, so this is a very simple model for a bunch of self-propelled um, interacting agents, uh, but it still exhibits some, uh, this kind of nice behavior. And since then, a lot of more elaborate theories um, have been proposed and analyzed. Um, there's been a lot of interest in generals like this to account for more, more physically or biologically relevant behavior. Um, but what I'd like to do is try to add um, to account for hydrodynamics um, using a rather simple model system to inform what a new model of this type might look like. So I'll start with something very simple. So imagine a, um, a infinite 1D line of flapping swimmers. So that's shown in this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, that's shown in this uh, sort of schematic right here. So you have a bunch of wings. Um, I think basically everything in this talk is going to be in 1D. So I'm gonna assume that the wings are moving on a line. We've done some work in 2D, but again, for the, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna have much time to go into that. Um, so you have a bunch of wings in a line. For now, they're separated by some fixed distance and each of the wings is flapping. So that's what this double arrow indicates. So they're flapping in the, um, in the vertical direction. And For all that with the same frequency and the same amplitude. Again, these restrictions can be relaxed, but in, for the sake of simplicity, let's just take this for now. And I think throughout this entire talk, I'm going to assume that the wings are going to move to the left. So this is the this is the convention that I'm going to use. Um, and the kind of nice thing about so this is in some sense the simplest system that you could hope to analyze if you want to try to understand um, hydrodynamic interactions between flapping objects. 
Um, now, the, the nice thing is that this sort of this sort of system can actually be looked at in the lab. So this is what was done um, in this experiment that was set up at the Courant Institute and the uh, results were published in this paper in Nature Communications about five years ago. Um, so what they did is they took uh, two diametrically opposed wings in a water tank. So you have a cylindrical water tank and you drive them both using a motor. So you have a motor that prescribes their amplitude and frequency. So the wings flap together. And these things are in a cylindrical water tank. So what will happen is that above a critical flapping amplitude and frequency, these wings move, um, but essentially one wing will fly into the wake, will swim rather into the wake of the other and vice versa. So this entire setup will rotate, right? So you're gonna essentially have two wings um, or rather this entire, uh, this entire system will basically spin like a helicopter, uh, like a helicopter blade. And what you're able to probe though is the dynamics essentially of one wing interacting with the wake of the other and vice versa. So if you imagine unwrapping this system, right? So imagine this thing is in steady state, uh, you can unravel the system and obtain exactly what you have above, right? You have an infinite 1D line of flapping swimmers separated by a fixed distance. So here, this is a video taken by, oh, uh, yeah, this is a video taken by Life Rist Rough. Um, and I think there's some, uh, perhaps there's some better videos coming later that show a little bit more, but this is a, uh, there are a bunch of particles put into the fluid here. They're illuminated by a laser sheet just so you can see what's going on. And you can see um, that are passing by. And it may be a little bit hard to see the vortices here. You can maybe see them being shed by the wings as the wings fly through. But for now, essentially the main point is that each wing is interacting with the wake of the other. Um, and the important thing to note here is that unlike many other studies uh, of this type, here the flapping motion is imposed, but the, the wings are freely swimming. So the horizontal speed of the wings is not imposed. So in that sense, this really is a, it's a truly self-propelled system. Um, basically the speed of the wings is determined by the hydrodynamic forces acting on them. So the question now was, well, what is the speed? What is the speed of the wing uh, of this flock, if you'd like? And how does that speed depend on the different parameters uh, in, in the system? So namely the flapping amplitude, flapping frequency. Um, because the distance L between the wings, although this in the experiment was fixed. So I'll address this point a little bit later. Um, so it turns out that a nice way to think about the data is in terms of this object called the schooling number, which I'm gonna denote by S. Um, so this object is, is gonna come back a number of times during the talk. Um, and what this thing means, it basically stands in for the number of strokes, the number of, um, yeah, the number of strokes separating neighbors. So it's the distance between the wings, L, divided by lambda, the wavelength of the flapping motion. So this is just another way of describing the data, which uh, the measurable quantity is the speed of the wings. Um, so the speed of the wings affects the wavelength, of course, the distance L is fixed. So the schooling number basically is just a stand in for the speed. Horizontal axis on this plot here, if we, if we look at the data, so this is all experimental data um, that was published in that uh, prior paper. Um, horizontal axis is the flapping frequency of the wings in Hertz, and the vertical axis is the schooling number. So the different curves here are different flapping amplitudes. Um, so they range from you know, roughly a little under a centimeter to five centimeters. Um, the wing, I think, has chord length six centimeters or so. So the flapping amplitudes are kind of comparable to the chord length, usually smaller. Um, so let's take one of these curves. Let's take the magenta one. Um, so that corresponds to flapping amplitude of two centimeters. And let's just kind of look at what this data, uh, what this data is saying and just make sure it makes sense. So at low flapping frequency, the schooling number is large, right? So you're at this upwards part of the curve. And that makes sense because at low flapping frequency, the wings are moving relatively slowly because they're not really flapping very hard. And that means that you have a large number of strokes that separates the neighbors. It takes, you know, between four and five strokes for one wing to reach the position where the other one was. As you increase the flapping frequency, the schooling number decreases. That's again, the wings are spinning. So you move down this curve as the, frequent, as the flapping frequency increases. 
And then you kind of plateau near schooling number two and a quarter. So these quarter numbers here are highlighted in this graph and they're gonna come back again later. Um, and then above a critical frequency, you get this abrupt jump where the system jumps down to schooling number one and a quarter. So what this looks like in the lab, this looks like a dramatic increase in the speed of the wings. So basically this entire wing, uh, wing setup will, will begin to move much faster because essentially the system goes from the wings need uh, two and a quarter strokes from, to get from one wing to the next to suddenly needing only one and a quarter strokes. So they're moving much faster. And then as you increase the frequency more, the schooling number doesn't really change much. It kind of, again, plateaus near this one and a quarter number. And now you can play the same game, but you can now decrease the frequency, right? So you can now do the sweep in the other direction and you come back along a different path. So that's shown here. And you have this you know, hysteresis loop that's characteristic of many nonlinear systems. You come back around as you decrease the flapping frequency and you approach some critical value. And then again, you abruptly jump up back to the original branch. So the main takeaway, oh yeah, and I should say that this, at least this qualitative behavior is observed independent of the flapping amplitude. So you look at the different flapping amplitudes. Of course, as the flapping amplitude decreases, basically as you're going towards the top right of this graph, the wings are moving slower, so the schooling numbers all get larger, but the system still has this general behavior where you have this region of flapping frequencies where you have a bistability of states. You have coexisting stable states, a slow state with a relatively large schooling number and a fast state with a relatively small schooling number. And I should note, this behavior is really due to the collective interaction of these wings. If you have a single wing in a tank, these curves would just be monotonically decreasing in the frequency, right? As you flap, as a faster, move faster, and that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing really uh, more interesting happening there. But because of the interactions of the wings, there's something strange happening here where you get this kind of these abrupt transitions between states. Um, so this is, this, is an, uh, this is a kind of a curious phenomenon. Um, and it highlights the fact that when you have flapping wings in a relatively fast flow, so the Reynolds number in the, the experiments is between 1,000 and 10,000. So it's relatively high. Um, so when you have uh, when you have a bunch of flapping wings interacting in this way, you can get non-trivial behavior and you, you can really get non-trivial collective behavior. Um, and part of the difficulty in understanding this behavior is that the numerical simulations for a system like this are pretty expensive due to the high Reynolds number. So that's not to say that people haven't studied the types of problems like this numerically. I've included some references here, um, but it is a challenging undertaking, particularly when you have a large number of bodies um, because you're doing uh, numerical simulation of not very strokes with a lot of bodies in a relatively fast flow. So we're gonna take a slightly different approach and try to see if there's a simple model or at least a conceptually simple model we can develop for understanding um, the collective behavior of flapping wings. Um, so I'll play this video again. So this video is taken by Sophie Ramanan Arrivo. Um, she's now, I think at Ecole Polytechnique um, in Paris by the time she was a postdoc in the Applied Math Lab at Courant. So she took this video here. And it's a little, it might be a little bit hard to see. So this is essentially of the same setup um, that I started with. Um, you can maybe see the wing here. It's where my cursor is on the left. Um, and for now, we're just gonna think about a single wing um, that's being driven sinusoidally and it's fixed in place. So it's not swimming, it's, it's not swimming horizontally. It's just being driven vertically. And there's an oncoming flow that's going to the right. Right, so this is just for the purposes of visualization. So we're not really looking at the swimming problem now, but we just want to look at the vortex shedding. So both of we injected dye um, at a couple different places on the wing. And essentially we can watch the dye being swept downstream um, as the wing flaps. So as you can see, the, the motion of the fluid is a little bit complicated, but there is some nice, um, there is kind of this nice ordered structure. You get this reverse von Karman wig that's characteristic of flapping, uh, flapping bodies. So you basically have this alternating sequence of vortices of positive and negative circulation um, that are both above and below the midplane of the, uh, of the wing. So, and of course you have a lot of other stuff going on in the fluid as well. Um, but our hypothesis that we're gonna take here is that really it's these vortices that mediate the interactions between the wings. 
and perhaps the other details of the fluid evolution don't matter as much. Um, so this is essentially what we're going to use to develop um, an analytically tractable model, which again takes into hydrodynamic interactions to understand why a system of interacting flapping wings would uh, would essentially execute the ordered formations that they do and the, the specific schooling states that they are observed to execute in experiments. So the model is a little bit, I think it's easier to describe almost kind of um, uh, pictorially first. So I'm gonna sort of describe, I'll describe it, um, at least the intuition um, here, and then I'll write down the equations below. So I should say, so this work was published recently in uh, PRX. Um, so you can read more details about it there. But so let's consider, just like in the experiment, a 1D line of flapping wings. They're all flapping in phase, same frequency, same amplitude, and again, all moving to the left. And what we're going to assume is that it basically at every flap, so to, or rather at every half stroke, each wing sheds a vortex of the appropriate circulation. So I'm going to play this video here. So as these wings advance, they're going to shed vortices. On the first flap, they shed a positive vortex in the upper half plane, then a negative vortex in the lower half plane, and so on and so forth. So you basically prescribe the, this. Um, so we hypothesize this vortex shedding is occurring through some mechanism that we're not going to model, but that you have a sequence of wings that's shedding vortices at a fixed circulation at the appropriate location. Um, now you need to know how do you advance these, that's at a given time, how do you advance these wings forward in time? Well, for that, you need to compute the hydrodynamic force due to all these vortices on one of the wings. And then if you have some drag force, the balance of thrust and drag forces will give you a net force that'll cause this wing to accelerate. That allows you to update the velocity and thus the position. So conceptually, it is quite simple. You have a bunch of wings shedding point vortices. This is all going to be, I should say, this is all going to be in 2D for now um, because we're going to use complex variable techniques to actually write the system down. Um, so you have a bunch of wings that are shedding point vortices in a fluid, and the, the temporal evolution of the system is governed by the hydrodynamic forces due to all of these vortices. So the, the system ends up having a form like this. So it takes the form of an iterated map. So the key things, so I should have said this uh, before, maybe this was clear from the video. Um, notice that we're not simulating the continuous time motion of flapping wings. So this is something again that, um, that perhaps could be done and I think has been done by, um, by some people, but um, the sort of, we're taking an even simpler approach where we're just sampling the wings position and velocity on the half plane, so at the, at, at the half plane. So we're imagining a sequence of wings that's hopping essentially from location to location, shedding vortices at the appropriate locations, right? So that's either above or below of either positive or negative circulation. Of course, in our minds, we think that the wing really went up and then down and thus shed a positive vortex or vice versa. But the model doesn't actually know about that, right? The model is just, um, just knows that there are vortices shed at every, at every time step essentially. So the variables that we need to evolve are the position x n. So n here is going to index time basically, um, and again it's a discrete index because I'm not modeling the continuous time evolution of the system. So x n is the position of one of the wings. Here again, the wings, the distance between the wings is fixed. So I really only need to consider the position of one of them. Then I know the positions of all of them, um, and the velocity of each wing is u sub n. So I'll start with the second equation here. So the the Evolution of x is just basically tied to the evolution of u, right? So the positions advance according to the velocities. T the flapping half period. So again, this is a dynamical system on half the flapping period because we're assuming that two vortices are shed per cycle, right? A positive vortex and a negative one. Um, so the velocity is where kind of all the interesting stuff is happening. Um, so we say the velocity is evolving in time according to two forces, the drag, that's what I'm denoting by FD, and the thrust. So the drag is something I'm going to prescribe. I'll say a little bit about that later. 
the thrust is what's interesting here. So the thrust depends on the position of the wing, its velocity in the horizontal direction, un, and the vertical direction, vn. vn is prescribed, though, because these wings are constrained to move along a line, at least in this model. Um, so there's no dynamics in the vertical direction. And most importantly, the thrust depends on the vorticity, omega n, right? So you have a bunch of point vortices that are in your fluid at every given time. So you need to know where they are and what their strengths are. So the vortices, that's this equation, that's the third equation down here that tells you about how the, um, how the vortex shedding occurs. We're gonna assume, and this is again, kind of illustrated in this, uh, in this video here, um, so the video kind of, if you, I don't know if you can see it, it, it is trying to show that the, uh, essentially the brightness of the vortices decays with time, right? So vortices shed in the far past are assumed to be weaker in strength than vortices shed in the near past. So this is a complicated process. This is basically, it, you can think of this in some sense as a stand in for three dimensional effects. So when you have a vortex that's shed by one of these wings, you might remember from the video as well, um, essentially it breaks up over some time scale. I'm not going to model this process. I'm just going to say that these vortices break up over some time scale tau, right? So I'm just going to put in this exponential factor. It's ad hoc. I'm basically putting it in by hand. Um, so I'm assuming that the existing vortices uh, decay in strength, plus I add new vortices at the locations of the other wings, right? So basically, at every time step, I decay existing vortices and I add new ones in at the appropriate locations and having the appropriate signs. So it becomes a problem where I have to keep track of all of those. Uh, I have to keep track of all of those things. So this completely specifies the system. So you have now. Um, I haven't told you yet how to calculate FT. So that's something that I'm going to have to do. Um, but basically, I have a uh, system of evolution equations for the position and velocity of one of these wings. Um, and basically, the velocities are being updated according to the thrust, which depends on the vorticity. So I also know how to update the vorticity. Um, so I think I've said most of these assumptions here. So I've listed the main assumptions of the model right here. Um, so yeah, I think I said this, but just to reiterate, the I'm assuming that the um, that the wings shed point vortices and they have some prescribed strength um, that's given. Ah, I also assume that the vortices do not move once shed. So of course, when you have uh, vortices in a fluid, they are going to move. They're going to induce a fluid flow, and they're going to move but I'm not gonna account for that um, in the model. And that's permitted, at least in the system that I'm interested in because the wings in the experiments and in biological systems, they move typically much faster than the uh, typical convection speed of vortices. So that's an effect that you can think of as higher order. Um, we're gonna use a viscous boundary layer drag law. So we're gonna assume that the, the drag is proportional to u to the three halves power. Um, you know, the details change depending on what drag law you use, but again, the, the model remains conceptually the same. Um, and one other thing I should highlight is that in calculating the force on one of the wings, so that's this thrust FT, I'm really I'm assuming that the presence of the other wings is only felt through the vortices. So in principle, I should, I should be calculating the hydrodynamic force on one of these wings um, by doing a calculation in a multiply connected domain because I have a sequence of bodies that are, uh, are in my that are in my domain. Um, so that's difficult. So I essentially ignore the presence of the other bodies and I only account for them through their vortices. So I'll say something at the very end. So um, I think Darren Craddy, who might be here um, in the department and Peter Badu, so they're experts on conformal mapping, particularly with uh, multiply connected domains. So that's a direction that we're, uh, we're pursuing now. But for now, at the level of this model, we're not gonna take into account the effect of the other bodies on a given wing. We're just gonna take into account the effects of the vortices. So I'll say something very briefly, um, and yeah, I won't spend much time on this um, because um, yeah, it's not really the point here. I'll say something very briefly about how we compute the thrust. Um, basically the thrust is computed using conformal mapping. So we assume that the wings are Joukowsky, Joukowsky foils. Um, so we use a conformal map to map them back to the circle, uh, back, back, back to the unit circle in the complex plane. Um, I'll just say we can write down the uh, complex velocity potential um, in, the, in the circle plane. 
um, taking into account the no penetration boundary condition on the surface of the wing. So the first two terms in this equation for W here take into account that no penetration boundary condition. Um, and then the summation term at the very end takes into account the point vortices and their images, again, to satisfy the, uh, the boundary condition on the surface of the wing. And then we choose the central vortex strength. So basically the velocity potential is determined uniquely up to, um, up to this log term. We choose the central vortex strength to um, enforce the, the cutting condition that the fluid flow is a finite velocity at the trailing edge of the wing. Um, once we have this velocity potential, the force is essentially a straightforward calculation where you have to integrate the uh, potential and its derivative over the boundary of the wing, and that gives you the hydrodynamic force. So I haven't written down the formula here because it's not particularly nice, but suffice to say that if you know the locations of the vortices and their strengths, you can calculate the force on, um, on a wing. And basically you have a formula for that. So what the equation looks like when all the dust settles, so I'm suppressing a lot of the details here, is you get a system of equations. So here I've non-dimensionalized the system. So the flapping half period is set to one. So capital T from a few slides ago is one. Um, and what you have here basically is that your position evolves according to the velocity like we had before. And the velocity evolves according to two forces, the drag. And then the thrust has been lumped into this ter term with the capital G. And what does it depend on? It depends on the relative position of, a, of the wing at time n and its past positions, right? So xk, k here is an index that's going over the past locations of the wing. And the reason the past locations matter is because that tells you where the vortices are. Right? So as the wing is advancing in time, it's shedding vortices. And the, essentially, the past position where those were. You need to know where they are because that'll influence the hydrodynamic force. You also need to know at what time those vortices were shed. So that's this index n minus k right here, or rather this argument n minus k, because that tells you how, how much those vortices have decayed. So you end up with this kind of strange looking equation where it's not your standard iterated map. Um, but it's a delay difference equation, right? Because you need the entire history of the system in order to find its new position at the next time step. Um, so the, yeah, so the velocity of the wing does not depend on its instantaneous position, but it depends on its past positions as well. So, but you, there's a reasonable amount that you can do semi-analytically here. So you can look for solutions where U is a constant. So that's where the wings are moving together at some steady speed. So it turns out that U satisfies some algebraic equation that you can solve numerically. And then the next question you can ask is you can ask, is this solution that I just found stable? So to do that, you form a standard linear stability analysis. You linearize your solution, uh, you, you linearize your equation around the steady state solution. Um, and again, you still uh, end up with a system of delayed difference equations, but at least they're linear. Um, and, it's, and you basically need to solve the system, solve this linear system. And the technique for doing that is the discrete Laplace transform. So I'm suppressing a lot of the details here, but um, I'll basically just say that you transform into this new variable, um, the Z variable. So that's the essence of the, it's essentially the discrete generalization of the uh, continuous time Laplace transform. And when the dust settles, what you end up with is a system of algebraic equations in the Laplace transform variables. So that essentially allows you to solve the system exactly um, in, in the Laplace transform variables. And the eigenvalues of the system, uh, eigenvalues of the linear system correspond to the poles of the, um, of the solution of the Laplace transform solution. So it turns out that your um, capital X and capital U is, uh, they're both proportional to one over some function f of z in the complex plane. So really what you need to do is you need to look for the zeros of this function f of z, right? So f of z is some awful function basically that accounts for the hydrodynamic interactions um, through, this func through these functions g1 and g2. So again, I haven't bothered writing it down, but basically the stability analysis problem comes down to a root finding problem. You need to find the roots of this function. And here uh, I use this approach from um, this paper by Delv and Lin, where basically you compute these contour integrals in the complex plane. Um, for various for various indices n, and from that you can uh, you can essentially back out what the zeros of f are, and 
basically depending on the location of the zeros, you can figure out whether the uh, system is stable or unstable. So let's see how this, so I've got, again, gone through this a little bit quickly, but framework for finding exact solutions to the evolution equations we propose and for assessing their stability. So now, now that we have this, we can now compare results against experiments. So this is the same data now that I showed you on uh, a number of slides ago. So the horizontal axis is the flapping frequency of the, uh, of the wings. The vertical axis is the schooling number. Um, and I've again highlighted the uh, quarter integer, the uh, integer plus a quarter schooling numbers here because they, they're going to show up again. And the triangles are the experiments. So it's the same experimental data that I showed previously. And the curves are the predictions of the theory that I laid out in the previous slide. So here I'm using different colors to denote different, uh, different states. So blue denotes states that are stable according to the stability analysis. Red denotes states that destabilize via saddle node bifurcation. So I have this cartoon here at the bottom. Basically, this is where an eigenvalue leaves the unit circle on the The green data points are those that destabilize via Hopf bifurcation. So that's where you have a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues that leave the unit circle. So you have, a, you have an instability that's oscillatory in nature. And then when you have a discrete dynamical system, you can have also something called a flip bifurcation, where you, um, the, you can have an eigenvalue leaving on the negative real axis. So you have these four different types of instabilities. Um, and if we just, and yeah, again, different curves here are going to denote different flapping amplitudes. Um, and as you can see here, what the theory predicts, it says that you're going to have branches that, solution branches, that go through the data, but then you're also going to have these red branches where there is no experimental data. So the interpretation basically is that you have stable branches that are connected by unstable ones, and the stable branches do overlap. So there's this region of flapping frequencies for which you have multiple, the theory predicts even you can have up to three um, at least for this parameter regime, you have coexisting stable. Um, so this is this is in the experiment, essentially where the bistability is coming from. You have stable states connected by unstable ones that destabilize via saddle node bifurcations. So you can now change the flapping amplitude, and you get this sequence of curves. Um, and you see that the experiment, uh, the the theory seems to do a reasonable, uh, reasonably good job. It's less good both at the extremes, so at the limits of high flapping amplitude, sorry, that's down here, the high flapping amplitude and low flapping amplitude. We think in the region of low flapping amplitude, that's where the point vortex assumption is probably going to break, because now the wings are actually pretty close to the vortices, and there the finite size of the vortices and the details of the structures that they generate are probably going to be important. And at really large flapping amplitudes, you have really violent fluid structures that are being created. Um, and there, we actually think even the curvature of the tank might start be becoming important because we're assuming that you know everything here is flat. Um, in this regime, the wings are really moving fast. So, a quick note about how we um, how we generate this plot. So, notice that there are three um, there are three parameters in this model. There's the vortex decay time, which I call tau. Um, the initial strength of the vortices is known up to a constant, or at least it can be estimated up to a constant. Um, and then there's the drag coefficient on the wings. So what we do is we take these three parameters, we fit them once, we select them once, and then we use this um, throughout all of this data because we think that the, um, really the experiments or the phenomena shouldn't depend, um, shouldn't vary with these parameters as this uh, flapping amplitude and flapping frequency change. So basically making one choice of these parameters allows us to get a reasonably good agreement between theory and experiment. So despite the stripped down nature of the model where we're really neglecting a lot of the details of the fluid dynamics, it seems like it does a reasonably good job of, um, of capturing the interactions between these wings. So I think maybe in the, the interest of time, I'll skip this. Um, I thought that would happen. And maybe I'll say something briefly about um, some other work that we did. So one thing that's a little bit strange about the uh, results that I just described is that the distances between the wings are fixed. Um, and this, of course, isn't you know, realistic in uh, biological systems and even um, a number of, you know, uh, of man-made systems, because the distance between 
the wings really could vary in time. So there was a more sophisticated experiment done where the distance L was allowed to vary. So you basically put a hinge in between um, uh, in, in the setup. So now the system has two degrees of freedom. So let's just consider two wings now. So you have a tandem wing setup, again, constrained to move along a line. You have two degrees of freedom, the speed of the wings and their relative position. So this is another video that um, was taken in the lab there. And I think this one makes it a little bit easier to see. So you have one wing that flying and the wing behind it, or swimming rather, and the other wing is swimming in its wake. And you see that the leader sheds this vortex pattern, this uh, reverse von Karman wake, and the, the follower, the follower wing is influenced by that fluid flow. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go through this rather quickly. The results um, of this study were published in um, uh, Physical Review Fluids a few years ago. Um, but the summary basically is that this is what the, uh, this is what the experiment looks like. So there are your two wings. There's kind of the hinge-like setup. You have a motor that's driving. So the camera is going to pan up and show you the motor. Um, you have a motor that's driving these wings, and you get um, you get what looks like a stable configuration where the two wings are separated by some fixed distance. So you can essentially play the same game. You can ask how do these distances vary as you change the flapping amplitude and the frequency. So this is this experimental data on the right here. So here I've changed it on you a little bit, but it's kind of the same idea. Horizontal axis is now the amplitude as compared to the chord length and the vertical axis is still the school num schooling number. And the different symbols here, the triangle, the square and the circle correspond to different flapping frequencies. And you see here that for a given flapping amplitude, you can have again, multiple coexisting stable states. So you can have the blue, the green and the red. And they correspond to schooling number roughly one and a quarter, two and a quarter, and three and a quarter. So what this thing looks like essentially is you have wings that are separated. You have equilibrium configurations where the wings are separated by different amounts, a different number of wavelengths. And this is spontaneous. So you basically start the system off in some configuration and it will spontaneously lock onto one of these configurations. So I'm not gonna say too much about this system. It's more of a lead into the, uh, to the next system that I want to think about. Um, but I'll just say that there's kind of a simple argument that can be made to understand the uh, presence of these numbers, uh, both in the system and in the previous one. So you can consider two wings um, and you can basically look at the effect, the hydrodynamic force due to the, on the follower, so that's the wing in blue, due to the vortices shed by the leader, that's the wing in black. Right, so the leader wing in black sheds this reverse von Karman wake, um, and you have um, and you have this. Uh, you basically want to calculate what is the force on the wing in blue. So, to do this, what you can do is you can take the hydrodynamic force on the follower and split it into two parts. You have the force that it exerts due to its own vortices. I'll call that F self. I'm going to throw that out. I'm not going to think about that right now. And then you have the interaction force due to the wings, due to the vortices shed by the leader. Of course, there are also going to be vortices shed by the red wing, but the dominant effect is due to the leader's wings. And in the regime where the flapping amplitude is large and where this object called the Struhall number is small, small number of amplitude relative to the flapping wavelength, and that number needs to be small, um, that's typically the case in the experiments, you can get a relatively simple formula for what the force on the follower wing is. So it looks like this um, infinite sum, but it can be written in a very simple form. It's basically proportional to the vertical velocity of the wing, that's V, and the vertical velocity of the induced fluid flow. All right, so this is the fluid flow that's generated by the leader. And that's given by the formula here. Again, the, uh, the details here don't matter. But basically the thing to remember is that the interaction force between wings can be approximated by the product of these velocities. So what you want to do if you want to look at stable configurations, assuming that the wings basically travel at the speed of a single wing, which tends to be the case, you basically need to look at the zeros of this interaction force. And the zeros of this interaction force you can show occur exactly at schooling number integer plus or minus a quarter. 
And then you can look at the stability of these configurations in a manner similar to what I described. And you can essentially convince yourself that the schooling numbers integer plus a quarter are stable and the schooling numbers integer minus a quarter are unstable. So the conclusion basically is that you get these stable schooling states. Again, in these, in these particular limits, the answers become quite simple. But outside of that, it's a, it's a more complicated problem you have to solve. But the ideas remain the same. Basically, you have, um, you have states where the hydrodynamic force is restoring. So if the wing were to speed up, it essentially experiences a larger drag that pulls it back to its original location. And if it were to slow down, it experiences larger thrust. And that's really due to the fact that the interaction force is the product of these two vertical velocities. So that's something that we're gonna keep in mind when we go to the last parts. I think I have a little bit of time to, um, have a little bit of time to describe that. Um, where we're gonna think about now a more kind of theoretical question that's uh, harder to probe in experiments. Uh, let's think about a dense collection of swimmers flapping again in 1D. So this, um, I should say, is joint work with Eva Conzo at USC and again, Mike Shelley at Current. Um, so here you have a sequence of wings that I'm indexing um, their positions here, or their horizontal positions are X1, X2, and X3, so on and so forth. Again, flapping all in phase with the same frequency, same amplitude, and moving to the left. Here though, they are independent. So they're, uh, I need to keep track of their positions as functions of time. Um, oops. And yeah, so to study the system, I'm not gonna look at the point vortex model that I had previously because that's, um, despite its simplicity, it's still a little bit complicated to analyze. I'm gonna think about a very simple dynamical model for how these wings might evolve. Um, and it's gonna be kind of inspired by those fluid dynamical considerations that I outlined in the previous slide. So this is gonna be a kinematic model. Um, again, this is just for the sake of simplicity, um, but I think some, uh, important, some interesting physics comes out of this. You basically say the velocity of a given wing is given by some constant u zero. So that's because all these wings are self-propelling and they like to move at some speed. Plus you have an interaction term, right? So that's this term proportional to u one. And basically the interactions are a little bit strange. Basically what it depends on, it depends on the relative phase of the relative flapping phase of each of these wings. And that's given by this object T minus TJ. And if you look at what this TJ is, TJ is asking at what time was the jth wing at this given location, Xi. So it's a little bit, it, it might be, seem a little bit convoluted, but basically what this thing is asking is, at what time was the wing in front at the location that the follower wing is currently at? Depending on what that time is, we are gonna know how much to decay the vortices, right? You have this exponential term that allows all these vortices to decay again over the scale tau. And then this cosine term, the sine of that will be determined again by this object omega times this difference in times. Right? And it basically is a stand-in for whether the, vort the nearby vortex at that location is a positive or negative circulation. Right? So this thing can be justified on the basis of a fluid dynamical argument based on actual vortices. But for now, I'm just going to take this as a simple model that accounts for vort vortex-induced interactions between swimmers. Um, and the main thing to notice, again, is that this is not a system of ODEs, but it's a system of delayed differential equations. If you think about how you need to solve this, you would need to store the entire history, the time history of each of the wings in order to find this function tj, right? You need to locate at what time were each of the wings at a given location. So this is now a system of delayed differential equations that I would like to try to coarse grain. Um, and the main, the main thing to do is to introduce These new, so you enter new variable, capital C and capital S, and these are functions of X and T, um, and they obey the equations shown. So I'll, I'm suppressing a lot of the details here, but maybe you can believe me that the system of delay equations can be expressed actually as a system of ODEs once you introduce these new field variables. And the way to think about it is that these functions C and S essentially are stand-ins for the vorticity field. They account for the fact that vorticity is being shed by each of the swimmers. And notice that they're indexed by i. I, in, uh, I basically denotes the different swimmers. So each swimmer sheds its own vorticity field, which evolves in time. And if you look at it, it's got this oscillatory structure where you have this oscillation on the flapping frequency 
at frequency omega. And then you have this decay over a time scale tau. And then to coarse grain the system, you introduce a density. So that's rho. And you introduce these continuum fields, capital C and S. And after some amount of work, you obtain a continuum model for a dense collection of these swimmers. So you get these PDEs. And if you look here, you have, a, um, you have your swimmer density that's given by rho. And it obeys an equation here. Notice here, I'm putting in now a diffusion term corresponding to nu. Um, so this is really a stand-in for some kind of noise or some kind of irregularity in the, uh, in the motion of the swimmers. So this is kind of a standard thing that shows up in many models for self-propelled swimmers. I'm just going to take that as a given. It's not really coming from the discrete equations here. So what this thing is saying is that you have a system of wings whose velocity depends both on, of course, the self-propelled speed u0 and the velocity that's induced by the fields c and s. And the field C is in turn forced by the density. And then S is kind of along for the ride. It basically, it accounts for the oscillation of these fields in time. So these fields are oscillating and decaying because again, they're stand-ins for vorticity. So this is a system of nonlinear PDEs um, that describes a dense collection of swimmers in 1D. So we can look at um, solutions of, or uh, solutions for this, of the system and I'll kind of sketch this out very quickly. So um, there's a trivial solution here where the density is constant. You can ask, is this state stable? And the answer basically is no, it's not necessarily stable. So you can perform a linear stability analysis of the constant density state. And you'll find that there is a band of wave numbers, k, along which the real part of the eigenvalue, so the um, instability eigenvalue is positive. So the system is unstable there. So basically we predict some kind of linear instability to develop um, in certain parameter regimes. So you can then do a numerical simulation of the governing equations. Um, so we do this thing in a periodic domain. So the first, uh, the first plot here shows the density as a function of space evolving in time. The second plot is really just a copy of the first, it's just a visualization to um, a, basically I'm putting a graph particles that are evolving according to that density, just so you can see what these hypothetical swimmers might be doing. And the third plot is the velocity, the local velocity of each of these particles. And hopefully what you saw there is that you can start with a uniform density state, introduce a small perturbation, and this perturbation destabilizes over time. So you run this thing forward in time, and what you end up with is a stable looking traveling wave. Right? So if you look at the particle picture, what this model predicts is that basically you're going to have you're going to start with a uniform density flock, and it's going to cluster into subflocks. You're going to get these subflocks of which are regions of high density, punctuated by regions of low density, and essentially the traveling wave behavior occurs because the leader of one of these subflocks accelerates and runs into the back of the one in front. And basically, this is like a process like dominoes, and you get these swimmers that essentially go from one flock to the next. So this is, the, this is a prediction that the, that the model makes, that you should get a breakup of this flock due to, and this is again, the only ingredient here really is hydrodynamic interactions. So they cause the breakup of this flock into little, um, little subunits. So I'll say something very briefly now, because I'm almost out of time, um, about these traveling wave solutions. So what we've done is we've developed a technique for systematically tracking these solutions as a function of the different parameters in this model. So you can substitute in a traveling wave ansatz um, where the density is moving at some speed c, and you end up with a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. So the PDEs now become ODEs when you're looking for traveling waves, and you get essentially a nonlinear eigenvalue problem in this wave speed c. Um, and what you end up getting are branches that look like this. So the plot on the left here shows the mean density of the flock, that's rho zero. And the vertical axis is the amplitude of the traveling wave. And the plot on the right basically shows the same thing, except it shows the speed of the wave. And notice what happens here, that for a range of densities, you get traveling waves non zero amplitude and of some speed, less than one. So here it's non-dimensionalized by the free speed of a single object. So you have traveling waves that move. The traveling wave speed tends to decrease with the density. right? So as you have a denser collection of swimmers, you should expect slower traveling waves. And maybe now I'll go essentially to the last, to the last point. 
So it turns out that you actually have a zoo of solutions. You have an entire family of solutions. Um, so here I have the same plot, horizontal axis, the density, the vertical axis, the amplitude, and you get a sequence of, you get a sequence of solution branches. And what do they look like? If I look at a fixed density, let's take rho equals 10. And I've shown you four of the density profiles right here along each of these different branches. So each of these solution branches are color coded. Notice that n equals one as one local minimum, n equals three as three. So essentially you have different solution branches corresponding to a different number of oscillations in your waves. So basically you have an entire family of traveling wave solutions indexed by the number of, the number of bumps in your solution basically. Um, and you can do the same thing for the wave speed. And you find that solutions that have a larger n, so basically have, that, have more oscillations, have a smaller wave speed, so they move slower. So these are all predictions that the, um, that the, uh, that the, um, the system of PDEs makes. And now, essentially, what we'd like to do is to look for some experiments or at least some biological um, motivation or confirmation of this. One of the main limitations, of course, of this model is that it is in 1D right now. So that's something that we're continuing to extend. Um, I think I'll skip that. So that basically concludes the talk. So just to have some conclusions um, and some future work up here. So I basically presented two models for understanding collective interactions between flapping wings in a fluid. Uh, first, I had an iterated map um, that has a little bit more detail about the, de about the um, specific fluid dynamics. And it's seems to yield quantitative maps with experiments on flapping wings in a water tank. And the main takeaway there is that you can get multiple stable formations that emerge essentially spontaneously due to hydrodynamic interactions. So you don't need really active control or anything like that. Hydrodynamic interactions are sufficient to give you ordered formations in 1D. Um, then to look at a collection of many wings, I presented a continuum PDE theory, um, again, inspired by the hydrodynamic system, that seems to exhibit multiple traveling wave solutions. And the traveling waves um, have certain properties like they tend to slow down as you get more undulations in the traveling wave. Um, so what are we doing now? So like I alluded to earlier, one of the things um, is a consistent treatment of multiple bodies using thin airfoil, small amplitude theory. So like I said, in the iterated map model, I'm not really, I'm not really correctly taking into, taking into account the fact that there are multiple bodies because I'm not doing a conformal map in a multiply connected domain. But um, with Peter, so this is a with, uh, Peter, Badu, uh, Nick Moore, and Darren Crowdy. Um, and mainly with Peter and uh, Darren's help, we've managed to um, get some nice results for multiple bodies, um, at least in this thin airfoil limit. And then really where we'd like to go is to generalize all these uh, uh, results to two dimensions and really uh, eventually three dimensions. So I have some 2D results. I didn't have time to talk about that. So where we can think about lattices of swimmers um, and look at how different lattice arrangements can influence um, uh, the hydrodynamic interactions between these bodies. Um, and really the goal is to go after these kinds of complex um, uh, displays that we saw in the first video and that are displayed in this photo right here. So some of you, just to conclude, some of you might've seen um, uh, this thing called the Toner 2 model. So it's a very influential model for um, it's a continuum theory for self-propelled particles. Um, really, it's based on the Vichek model. Um, and what we'd like to do essentially is produce something of this type, but that takes hydrodynamic interactions into account. So uh, I'd like to thank all these people and support from the Simons Foundation. And thank, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Alan. So uh, we have time for questions. If you, if you want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat or, or just unmute yourselves and, uh, and, and ask it. No, well, I, okay, can uh, I, yeah. May I ask a question? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, Shuzong. Uh, Okay, so this you are a PDE model. And before you did the PDE, you have this um, OD uh, dif difference. Right. Way. So so you, you said the coarse grain, did, did you do uh, homogenization or, or or it's kind of phenomen phenomenological derivation? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So at this stage, it's it's more phenomenological. So we didn't do a formal homogenization. That is something that I would like to do. Um, I'd like to do at some stage. So this really, for now, it's a um, it's essentially a uh, uh, it's it's more phenomenological. It's a, it's a manipulation. So you so I introduced this yeah, yeah. density yeah. as a sequence of these delta functions, and then you turn yeah, the yeah. crank, integrate by parts, and then you um, you essentially forget about a lot of the details about. Um, you know, whether, so, so it, it, that is a question basically, do solutions yeah. to the delayed system converge to solutions of the yeah, continuum yeah. system in some limit? So we do have some ideas on this, but uh, we don't have anything, we don't have anything airtight on that right now. Is it possible to do this homogenization? Uh, look at the cell problem and then look at the average one. That's a good, uh, that's a good point. Um, we haven't really, thought about that, or we, we haven't done it, but I suspect it might be possible. Um, the difficulty is that because the system, the original system is a system of delay equations. Um, so I think that makes this a little bit more difficult. And what ends up happening, yeah. like I said, is that you end up with uh, these fields that you have to account for. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's a good point. I, I, th I think it might be doable. Okay. May, may I ask a quickly another one? It seems sure, sure. That, okay. You kind of, if you wave your hand, <laughs> you can say, okay, this is just one of this um, self-organization um, behavior in, in kind of dissipative, nonlinear dissipative system. So, so, you know, there are a lot of uh, behaviors which are probably generic, right? So the details of the interactions probably don't matter because even in your model, you injected a lot of, uh, you know, especially the first one, some specific uh, hydrodynamics. But by the end of the day, probably it's, it's not, in, maybe not that important the detail. It's just a kind of way of communicating between individuals or certain. Uh, so, so, you know, what, 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 how we should we look at this? You yeah. Know, what level, you know, we, Sure, sure, sure. No, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so I think, I, I think you're, you're probably right. So we haven't looked at this. Um, I think I haven't looked at this enough to really be able to comment, but I think you're probably right that the details of the specific, the specific hydrodynamics or, you know, the details of the specific flow fields that you generate and the flapping motions and that sort of thing, they may not matter depending on what you're looking at. So if you're looking yeah, at some yeah. kind of yeah, sure. general yeah. phenomenological behavior, it probably doesn't matter. I think the main ingredient that makes this different from other self-propelled sy systems is this memory, essentially, that mm -hmm. when, when you have vorticity being shed into the fluid, it persists for some amount of time. Yeah. Um, and that's the medium through which these particles interact. Um, mm -hmm. so it's not an instantaneous interaction where the, no, no, mm -hmm. the is, well, can do some sensing and then they move, or it's not even really about them cognitively storing some information. Cause you do some see models like that, where there's some kind of delay due to cognition, right? That it takes some amount of time for the mm -hmm. bodies to process what they're doing. And then they have to move. Um, that's not what this is. This is again, being delayed due to, yeah, yeah. um, what's happening in the fluid. So I think that's the main, that's probably the main novel, uh, the, yes, the main yes, novelty of this model. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I think that's that's probably it. But otherwise, you're right. I think the, the precise details um, probably are not too relevant if you're looking at general phenomena. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mute myself. Yeah. Um, if if I I can ask something for the sure. uh, regarding the I guess the the biological problem when you do this uh, theory and you get the solutions is is the do they minimize some some kind of energy that the biological system would like to achieve yeah uh, that's, a good, uh, um, that's, that's something again that we have, would like to do we haven't we haven't really we haven't been able to do it yet um and we uh, not that we've spent a whole lot of time on it so i i suspect the answer is yes i think there should be there must be, or I think there should be a very, essentially a variational formulation of this where these, um, the system is maybe achieving some kind of a ground state um, and they're essentially minimizing something. Um, but it's not, yeah, at, at this stage, it's, at this stage, it's not totally clear. Um, right now, our, our main arguments are restricted to, you know, thinking about forces. So we have, um, you know, essentially we look at, you know, thrust and drag, balance of thrust and drag gives you a speed. 
And then essentially whether the force is restoring or not tells you whether the solution is stable or unstable. Um, I think you're probably right though, that there's, um, there's probably something there, something that's being minimized here. If I can go on a quick, I know I'm kind of answering about it. I mean, answers I don't, I don't really know. Um, the, in the biological literature, there's, a, there's quite a bit of controversy over this that you know, when it comes to animals, like what exactly are they minimizing? Um, and, and I think that's not at all clear. Um, so that's why I didn't have time to talk about this, but the metrics, we, we look at two metrics, basically one is speed. So you wanna maximize speed. And the other is essentially efficiency, and there are arguments about how you should measure efficiency. Um, but there have been arguments uh, advanced in the literature that maybe biological organisms care less about speed, and they care more about efficiency metrics. Um, so that could be that could be possibly what's happening. Um, but I, I, my understanding is that there there is no real consensus on that yet. Okay, thank you. And yeah, anyone else? Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll ask another one. I'll ask a question. Yeah, I, uh, Eric, go I'll ahead. I'll put my camera on. Let's see if I know how to do this. Can you guys see me now? Yes. Oh, hey, Eric. Hi, how, how are you? Yeah, thanks, hey. thanks for a nice talk. Um, I was curious about, so, so I'm, I guess I'm more in the low Reynolds number end of kind of thinking about swimming things interacting with one another. Right. And I was just curious about whether you could, um, so, so I know in, in these kinds of continuum models, you would actually explicitly take into account the fluid. So you would couple your kind of density field for the, for the swimmers with uh, the momentum balance for the fluid. And I was wondering if that, I mean, I guess that's kind of what, what you're capturing with this delay differential equation or, or with your delay, like you would insert your point vortex somewhere in space and then you wait for the, the swimmer to come by. That's right. I was wondering if within your model, it might be, if, if you had considered actually coupling it with a fluid that, you know, the, you, you, you know, your swimmer comes by, it forces the fluid, and then you account for the fluid, you know, entirely in space, and then um, look at when other swimmers come by. If you see what I mean, just have the fluid as another, uh, as a field Absolutely. In the background that you keep track of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I would, uh, that would be great. And that's, and that's basically the next step. Um, okay. that, that's exactly what I'd like to do. So I think, I think this is not, um, I think this is possibly a little bit challenging because of the, uh, essentially because of the Reynolds numbers involved. So there's the, uh, the coupling is probably going to be difficult or at least difficult to solve. Um, yeah. So I think maybe there's going to be some simplification that we're going to need to do, but that's exactly. Yeah, I, I think, I think you might be able to to do essentially what you have now, right? So where you, as the swimmer comes by, it makes a vortex right, in, in the background. And then you say it decays at some, at some time with some time sure. scale. Sure. Um, I mean, I guess that's, I mean, that's what I was thinking is kind of the, the analogous um, approach is what you're doing now, right? So you, you have a vortex and it decays at some right. time scale. Um, and, it, and it might make things easier when that's you right. go down. That's right. But, but I think doing, yeah, I, ahead, and it might make things easier when you go to higher dimensions as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the thought. And then generalizing the more complicated dynamics when, when we get off the 1D stuff, right? Then yeah, yeah. You, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's absolutely right. That's really what we'd like to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd probably get more accurate predictions about what exactly the fluid is doing. Because right now, I'm basically putting it in by hand. But I think if you do something like what you proposed, it would, yeah. it would definitely be interesting. Yeah, it's a good okay. idea. Great, thanks. Yep. Good. And anyone else? Um, well, one question about your your PDs, the very last, um, the the kind of uh, short wavelength solutions that come up as you increase n, I guess. Yep. Um, do those? So, so the, these are traveling wave solutions, right? Uh, you got this by solving the nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Correct. Are, they, are they stable, unstable, kind of modulationally uh, unstable? Yeah, I, I, did, I ran out of time there. So um, I'll quickly flash or I'll put, put the slide up. So they, um, some of them are stable. Um, so maybe the easiest one to, I'm thinking which is the easiest one to look at. So maybe let's look at the plot on the left. 
So I've just here colored the different branches by blue being stable, red being unstable. Um, and as you can see, for a given branch, it you know it can have this behavior. I don't know if you can see my cursor where at high density it starts off as stable, then it goes unstable for a bit, and then it goes back to being stable. Um, but the so in general the behavior is a little bit complicated. But as you can see, as I go downwards, the increase n then the branches tend to get more and more unstable. So like you, I think like you suspected, the ones with the high frequency branches tend to be unstable. Mm -hmm. Right. To, to wavelengths. Um, to I wavelength. haven't seen any modulation, which is strange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, I haven't seen any modulation, like kind of, yeah. I, I basically, uh, so far in the simulations, I've only seen traveling waves. So I have traveling waves that break up into other traveling waves, but I haven't seen anything um, other than that. So that's not to say it doesn't exist, but I'm wondering if maybe some additional dynamics might need to be added um, if we want to see modulation, because things like modulation, that's what you see more in biological systems. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem to be captured here. And, and um, how, how big was the new or small? Ah, um, so if you compare it to, um, yeah, let's compare new to, let's say you can define like a diffusivity due to self propulsion. So that's the velocity squared times the time scale over which you have decay. Um, so you can compare new to that. It's about between a tenth and a hundredth. So it's it's small compared to this um, this other diffusive time scale in the problem. Um, so essentially what happens, yeah, so I kind of swept this under the rug. If new is too big, you get nothing. Uh, then you don't, get, you don't get any of this nice behavior. Then essentially the flock remains constant density throughout. Mm -hmm. um, so you need new to be small in order to allow the hydrodynamic interactions to dominate. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, great. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we're kind of 13 minutes of questions. So if there's no other questions, let's, uh, let's thank Anand again for a very stimulating talk. Thank Thanks you so again, Anand. Thanks. And we'll see everyone next week. Yep.